no security threat to 2023 general elections. Inspector General of Police assures Nigerians. Our personnel do not bear firearms while on duty. FRSC said that. Well, good morning, Nigeria. Today, we shall discuss with Simpkin University Economy. Universities all over the world generally engage in research, teaching, and community service, as well as serve as instruments for individual, societal, and national development. The ivory tiles are also centers for acquisition of skills, development of mental, physical, and social competence of their products to make them useful to the society. Now, the uh, lingering ASO strike, which has been extended indefinitely, is already throwing up issues on the governance structure, as well as the autonomy of public universities, including the need for university governing councils to think outside the box with regard to funding models and investments uh, that can provide sufficient revenue base for administering the ivory tiles and making them competitive uh, rather than the current scramble that they are compared to engaging for the dwindling uh, revenues of government. In this case, Lee, the public universities are compelled to go cap in hand to the federal and state governments for funding and with the rising cost of university education and the shortfall in government revenues, the question remains, is it sustainable to have government funding university education completely? Yes, well, the founder of a private university, uh, Chief Arthur Balola, the learning senior advocate of Nigeria, once said that without financial independence, universities' wings to fly are clipped and it is left to walk or at best crawl. Now, uh, it is true that uh, some state governments borrow to pay salaries. What then is the fate of universities in terms of funding, whether at the state or federal levels? This is why where there is a renewed quest for the clamor for university autonomy. But experts also have called for proper definition of the kind of university autonomy that should be practiced. It has been established that university education is costly. On one hand, majority of students are from poor, poor backgrounds and are not able to finance education at the tertiary level. However, on the other hand, a university should have adequate resources to be able to manage the university so that it will be competitive and viable. And uh, this is what, of course, is lacking in uh, most if not nearly all the uh, public universities to the federal and state, as they are virtually on their knees in terms of having the requisite infrastructure and facilities for learning and research that will produce the desired manpower to revamp all aspects of our national life. Now, public universities are currently handicapped and operating a kind of contributory model of funding where monies come mainly from budgetary allocation, TED fund, and others. Experts have emphasized that funding tertiary education goes beyond paying the salaries of lecturers and that insistent strikes by the academic staff union of universities, such as the current one, which has led to the loss of a full academic session, is certainly not the solution to these challenges. It's also been emphasized by analysts that the composition of university governing councils should not be politicized by populating them with members who are merely appointed on the basis of political compensation, but rather governing councils should comprise uh, persons and professionals who have requisite experience, qualifications, and business acumen to manage the ivory tower as viable enterprises by scouting for funding models and indeed getting in the revenue that will make investors financially autonomous. So is it not time universities had full autonomy in Nigeria? What are the implications of granting full autonomy to universities? And how can universities become viable and competitive as well as relevant to their vicinities and the society at large? We shall have guests speak. On the issue on Good Morning Nigeria today, I am Jumwe Yesof, welcoming you to another episode of the program. 
And I'm Kingsley Osadolo. I join my colleague Jumai to also welcome you to the program. And Jumai, by the way, we had a number of uh, conversations now around the ASU strike, mm -hmm. and there are many matters that are arising mm -hmm. uh, from mm -hmm. the lingering mm -hmm. strike, uh, which has been uh, uh, extended indefinitely and is said to be comprehensive. And in total, we've asked the question, what is the meaning of the current university autonomy? Mm -hmm. You cannot say you have autonomy and at the same time you are quarreling virtually every day with the federal government uh, for your sustenance. You're asking federal government to do X, Y, Z for you. What does the university autonomy currently mean? And how can we rethink uh, university autonomy? And of course, there's also the uh, uh, collateral issue of mm -hmm proper funding of our universities and okay. where that funding uh, okay. should and will come from. You compare with other clients around the world and how the autonomy in their universities is making education you know, viable for everybody to attain. Yeah, that's right. Well, this, it's uh, again, good morning, Nigeria. We're live for the network service. Oh, you're yeah, welcome, Kisley. You know, well, I've been around for a I've not seen you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Jubai. And... Uh, as always, we have our complimentary segments, and this is the Newspaper Review in Business. For now, let's uh, take the highlights of the morning news with Nolene Ebelame. Good morning, Nolene. Good morning, Kisley and Jumai. Good morning, Nigeria. Here is the news. The federal government has assured the Projects Development Institute, Proda, Enugu State, of adequate support towards realizing its mandate of promoting the establishment of indigenous industrial projects through research. Minister of State Science, Technology and Innovation, Henry Oko, gave the assurance in uh, Enugu during a familiarization tour and inspection of facilities at the institute. We need to also get people, private sector, every economy, everywhere in the world. For you to grow, you must work with the private sector. Anything you think that the ministry can help you to do, we will do that. The federal government says the ban on movement of urea fertilizer in the northeast is still in force and warns that it will go tough on illegal producers and distributors of the farming impute. The federal minister of agriculture gives reason for high cost and scarcity of fertilizer in the country. The government is making concerted efforts to ensure that these raw materials, we intensify our efforts to be able to have them for the benefit of our farmers and for food security. But in order to reduce that over-dependency on other foreign countries for this raw material, there is need to, intens to intensify our effort towards the explorations of these two major inputs that we used to import from overseas. On security, the Inspector General of Police, Usman Baba, has assured that there is no threat to the 2023 general elections in the country. The IGP gave the assurance during the United Nations Chiefs of Police Summit in the United States of America, where he met with the Assistant Secretary, U.S. Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, Todd Robinson. A statement by Force Public Relations Officer, Olumuiwa Dejobi says this stems from the robust security threat analysis carried out using global best standards to ascertain the trend of expectations from the electionary processes. Adejobi also noted that during the meeting, discussions centered around enhancing support for the Nigeria police training and capacity building programs, particularly the training of tactical units deployed in the northeast and other conflict theaters across the country. The Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa, has called on religious leaders in the country to pray for national growth and prosperity. This was during a church service marking the retirement of Chief Judge Adama State Justice Nathan Musa after attaining the age of 65 held at St. Monica Lutheran Church of Christ Cathedral, Yola. Okay. Dr. Musa and his family. We want to thank you 
for constantly upholding both of us in the blessings of responsibility in prayer and with counsel and guidance. Two dead bodies have so far been recovered from the debris of a seven-story building still under construction at Obaidowu Oniru Street, Victoria Island, Lagos, which caved in early hours of Sunday. We had some noise that um, breaking blows are coming down. Then those there are the brigglers that are living inside there. Most of them. They have been shouting to the, their friends that uh, something is about to happen, something is about to happen. Then, um, as we had the shouting, in two, uh, it's in two minutes, then the building collapsed. Ogu State Governor Dapo Abiodun sympathizes with the victims of petrol tanker explosion which occurred on Saturday 3rd of September 2022 at Matagun Ifo local government area of Ogu State. In a statement, the governor described the incident that damaged about 10 houses and shops as unfortunate. Governor Abiodun calls for calm and assures that work will be expedited on Ijoku Akute Road to forestall reoccurrence. Calabar, the Cross River State capital, and environs have been plunged into darkness following a fire outbreak on Sunday that ravaged part of the transmission company of Nigeria TCN in Abiobu community in Calabar municipality. Although the actual cause of the fire is yet to be ascertained, eyewitnesses say they only saw the fire smoldering from the transmission line. Residents are hoping the relevant agency will do the needful to repair the damaged transmission line and restore power supply. Federal Road Safety Corps wishes to inform the public that personnel of the commission have not started carrying guns or any other firearms whether or on patrol or not or on duty. The FISC says this clarification is necessary following the recirculation on social media on, of an operative captured on camera carrying a rifle belonging to a staff of another agency in 2018 in a position that suggests he was on official duty. Reiterating the commitment of the Corps to safer routes, the acting Corps Marshal Dauda Alibiu states that officials of the Federal Road Safety Corps do not currently carry arms and advises members of the public to disregard the image being recirculated. That's the news for now. Good morning. Nigeria continues with Jumai and Kinsley after this timeout. Please don't go away. I am Nolene Ebel Ame. You are watching Good Morning Nigeria on the network service of the NTA. Next on the program is Business News with Comfort Ahmadou. <laughs> Nigeria has renewed its strategy and efforts to increase the quality and volume of exports of indigenous products and produce to global markets to boost its GDP and foreign exchange earnings. The rejection of agricultural produce at the international commodity markets, however, remains a challenge. The chemical aspect and the biological aspect of how food is processed is called to question. With the recent ban of more than 17 Nigerian products from entering Europe due to quality and standard, the federal government is developing stiffer quality assurance measures to change the narrative. In order to activate the necessary links and the codes for verification of certification of produce and conformity assessment digitally from any part of the world, Meanwhile, the Director General of the National Automotive Design and Development Council, Jelani Aliu, says Nigeria is repositioning its automotive industry 
to increase the country's competitiveness in the automotive world and also enhance revenue generation. We've also been meeting uh, with uh, potential investors uh, from around the world. Uh, some of them have committed to come into Nigeria and invest. Uh, we're at the stage of really finalizing and fine-tuning some of those agreements so that the country could, would really benefit from that foreign direct investment. He said NADDC is developing policies and programs that will woo more investors to the sector. Would be Sness News, Comfort, and Modu. Thank you very much, Comfort, for the business package. Coming up next is New Super Review. <laughs> We have quite a busy front page on the Vanguard newspaper this morning. Let's begin. Above the mass head, we have presidential interview. Adewole Adebayo. Like a battle loof, we will recover stolen crude under Buhari. You find details on page 14. Daily fuel supply remains 68 million liters. NMPC insists. That's on page 7. OB not on fund raising tour. You find um, the details on page 11. And um, below the mass head, we have the headlines in the Vanguard newspaper. Worry in APC, PDP, ADC as party chairman battle conflict. With riders, fresh push to oust Adamu over APC's Muslim Muslim ticket heightens. Wiki's camp in fight to finish with IU. Why APC presidential aspirants party was botched. Ralph Nwoso's tenure as ADC chairman has lapsed. You find uh, presidency, Senate Morris banning same faith ticket. You find details on page 8 and 5. By the side page of the illustrated uh, premium income insurance life pension segment, they say it crashes by 62%. With rider down to 13.6 billion in first quarter of 2022 from 36.1 billion in first quarter of 2021. Segment most dives as retirees live longer. Business eroding profit insurance laments. And the side piece of the picture illustration no threat to Nigeria's 2023 elections. IGP assures UN police chiefs. You find details on page 8. Airs Holding appoints Indubisi or Sadolo board member. You find details on page 8. Hair Holdings appoints Indubisi and or Sadolo board members. Details on page 8. At the bottom plate of the illustration, the picture 2023 Northern Senators orders upset over weekend's opposition to Atiku. That's coming from a source. You find details on page 7. At the bottom plate of the Vanguard newspaper, nine die in Abuja crash, FRSC warns against night trips. Details on page 6. How federal government saved Ajakuta steel industry reduce dispute cost to 496 million. That's coming from Malami, page 7. Niger government discovers 4,000 unqualified teachers. You find the details on page 13. Yes, Lee? All right. We also took a look at the front page of the leadership newspaper. Uh, leadership newspaper, above the name plate, you have the following headlines. Uh, we are open for forensic audit of fuel supply. That's according to the NNPC. We are open for forensic audit of fuel supply. And Senate gets bill to amend section 84 and ban same faith ticket. You know that says uh, customs evaluation policy fuel and smuggling. Motor dealers cry out. And then at uh, leadership uh, Twitter spaces, CSOs ask federal government to implement a waste report. Now the late story it uh, comes with a kicker as 2023 campaign uh, begins in 23 days. Nigerians seek competence above 
party, religious, and ethnic considerations. Uh, Nigerians seek competence above party, religious, and ethnic considerations. Uh, there are a number of riders to that. Say next president must be competent, healthy, and of good character. Now we want leaders uh, who can get this nation out of the woods. No threat to next year's elections, uh, IGP assures Nigerians. And you have the illustration there on the front page, how Nigerians are likely to vote in 2023. Well, the elections are st still many months away in uh, February next year. But more interestingly, it's a web Nigerians want incoming government to tackle insecurity, economic hardship, decayed education sector, unemployment, bad roads, epileptic power supply, and corruption. And then just one piece uh, from the left-hand side there, it says Kenya's Supreme Court to rule on presidential election dispute today. So those are the stories uh, from mm. the papers. Uh, virtually nothing of uh, tremendous interest for uh, for discussion. Uh, okay. I don't know. The stories are just uh, basically the ones we have. Uh, basically, basically. Uh, yeah, we can talk about this no threat to Nigeria's 2023 elections by IGP assures UN police chiefs and the assurance that they will help support the Nigerian police during the election. I think that's a good move, actually. Uh, it's a good move, uh, but the assurance should not be to outsiders. The assurance mm -hmm. should be to insiders. Mm -hmm. Nigerians where the stakeholders are in the meantime. So, uh, then, uh, of course, law enforcement is important and having to ensure that there is... Uh, the proper atmosphere and suitable atmosphere for the conduct of the polls uh, will be critical to uh, the credibility of, of next year's uh, elections. The other story about NNPC saying they are ready for uh, forensic audit of fuel supplies. I, I think that this is, of course, uh, in response to the widely reported comments made last week by the Comptroller General of Customs while appearing before a committee of the House of Representatives on Finance. Mm. Uh, and, and the uh, Comptroller General of Customs raised pertinent questions uh, about uh, the figures normally are allocated uh, to uh, fuel supplies and the claims about smuggling. Mm. And they then raised the questions, how many trucks are, are required to smuggle uh, say 38 uh, million liters of, of petrol every day and then can the numbers be constant mm. these are the no, this is the, the quantity of fuel you supply every day, every day. those are pertinent issues that you raise and all this uh, ready claim of readiness to uh, undertake or be willing to subject yourself to a forensic audit of i think nigerians are basically tired of all these forensic audits just oh. do the right thing that's the pertinent thing. that's the most important thing and uh, as the controller general of custom said what is what are the numbers that we're actually dealing with and more importantly how many vehicles do we have in nigeria that use petrol how many vehicles we are told that about 50 percent of of uh, vehicles. The vehicles that we have in nigeria can be found in in the lagos or go axis mm. of, of the country uh so Kano is populated, uh, but Port also uses and it finds uses also in the south. But mm. what is our daily consumption of PMS? But well, NMPC is insisting 68 million liters. But can it just be every day? Every day you consume mm. 68. Do you buy fuel every day? No, no, I don't. I don't buy fuel in my car every mm. day. I mean, even, even those who are transporters, uh, how many of them uh, are, are on, the, on the road every day and mm. topping up their tanks? Uh, virtually every day. So, but the whole issue relates to, look, what are we talking? What are we doing about smuggling? Mm. What is it that we are doing about the huge subsidy payments? And that's where the uh, outgoing is uh, from uh, the, the, the national post. And besides, if we were producing uh, fuel locally, if we were refining fuel locally, all of these questions of, will be virtually uh, immaterial. Yeah, it will be addressed indeed. Yeah. Um, I, I think, like Casey said, it's not much to talk about in the papers today. We'll take a break. When we return, our conversation will begin. Don't go away. You are watching Good Morning Nigeria on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. As a prompt for our conversation, which is on rethinking university autonomy, Let's listen to this background report put together by our correspondent, Abu Salam Jibril. From extension 
it has become an indefinite strike by the academic staff union of universities ASO, which has lasted for over six months now. For students who bear the brunt of the language strike, the boredom is overstretched and they just want to go back to school. The ongoing strike by ASO has engendered conversations on issues that include university autonomy, governance structure, and funding. In the area of autonomy, some experts have stressed that university autonomy and funding is an important aspect in university-level education due to its impact on graduates' competencies and on the quality and quantity of research produced. They maintain that, once upon a time, university education in Nigeria was not associated with the problems of autonomy and control. But by the 1970s, the calls for autonomy became stringent and the search for autonomy has become a long drawn out worry for government owned universities with every effort aimed at securing autonomy, particularly in the area of academic freedom. In other climes around the world, there are different autonomous funding systems available to universities that includes government funding, funding from industries and private companies, funding from non-profit organizations, foundations or donations, and international funds coming from foreign government or funding agencies. In Nigeria, majority of the government-owned university rely on government for their funding. Some education experts have argued that the lack of autonomy in the nation's universities contributes to the inability of the university system in realizing the principal business of the university education, which is the development of academic contents, teaching and research. Will autonomy for Nigerian universities be a solution to the recurring industrial actions in the university system? How can Nigerian universities achieve autonomy towards improving the educational system? These issues and more will form the crux of discussions as guests speak to issues of rethinking university autonomy on the program shortly. And we have guests to discuss the topic. Let me introduce here in Abuja studio Professor Yakubu Aboki Ochefo. He's the Secretary General Committee of Vice Chancellors of Nigerian Universities and also Secretary General Committee of Post Chancellors of Nigerian Federal Universities. It's a pleasure to have you join us. Pleasure is mine. Okay, um, we are expecting a guest in our Benin Network Center. He will be there uh, shortly, we understand, but once he arrives, we will introduce him. Now, uh, part of this conversation we are having uh, via Zoom, Professor Christian Anieke. Professor Anieke is the Vice Chancellor of Godfrey Okoye University in Enugu. Professor Okoye, I pray that Professor Anieke, uh, it's our pleasure to have you this morning. Thank you for inviting me. Good morning, Nigerians. All right. So, uh, gentlemen, let's begin this conversation this way. Happily, we had uh, Professor uh, Ochefu with us uh, on Friday uh, when uh, we discussed aspects relating to the lingering strike, and there were a number of matters that were thrown up, including uh, issues around uh, university autonomy, because uh, autonomy and governance and the structure and governing council a resolution or crisis uh, within the university uh, uh, system before they become a blowout such as we frequently have with us who go in on strike uh, almost every uh, academic session. These are matters we would like to focus on, on whether uh, the current uh, level of autonomy that uh, Nigerian universities have uh, is adequate uh, and what needs uh, to be done. Uh, let's begin with uh, Professor Ochefu. Professor Ochefu, we know there was a time that there was uh, a campaign for autonomy for Nigerian universities uh, and, and then that of course uh, that campaign was won but it would appear that uh, the autonomy that uh, public universities have in Nigeria uh, is largely in name only so tell us uh, what happened uh, and what is happening uh, thank you very much the the fact of the matter is that the whole principle of autonomy is factored on 
the law establishing the university. Um, it is in that law that the objectives of the university, the philosophy of the university are all enshrined. And the, the laws establishing the federal universities in Nigeria um, take their origin, their historical origin from the British universities. The British universities in turn also take their own origin you know, from the first set of teacher-led universities. When the university tradition started, it started as a guild of students. A number of students will come together and invite professors to come and teach them. Uh, but the students set such high standards, you know, and, and uh, the professors felt, or the teachers, which were uh, largely monks, felt that those standards um, were not um, appropriate. So a number of um, uh, professors now got together and set up their own guild of professors, you know. So you had professor-led universities, and over time, the ones that were founded by students dropped by the wayside. So um, that tradition has been on for like about 900 years, where you see the, the university vested in the guild of professors, who are the ones who drive the whole system. Now, um, so our law, the laws establishing uh, Nigerian federal universities, from the first university that was established by the colonial government, and the first university that was established by the Federal Ministry of Education, and the first university that was established by the Eastern Regional Government, these were the first set of universities um, in Nigeria, had a semblance of this um, uh, professor-led university system. Uh, and that law, the law that establishes them, derives its strength from there. Um, and basically what it says that the university can award degrees, can do this, can do um, a plethora of things. Uh, but by and large, the how does the university support its operations? That is where our current laws vis-a-vis -vis the autonomy of the university um, stands on one leg. Um, the funding of public universities, especially the ones owned by federal government, you know, um, are driven largely by subventions and grants from its proprietor. You know, uh, in the public university, in the private universities, the tuition is a critical co uh, component of the funding of those universities. Mm -hmm. You know, so up until the late 80s, early 90s, the core issue of autonomy that the academic staff union struggled with was the appointment of principal officers of the university, especially the vice chancellor. Uh, and the matter became so, so vexatious that it became a major pillar, a major point of focus for, for ASU. Um, and that had to do with the fact that once the selection exercise um, uh, takes place, the final nominees end up with the visitor to the university, who is the commander-in-chief, the president and commander-in-chief. And the visitor had a short list of three persons, and he, he could choose any of the three. You know, and it was President Obasanjo who now said, um, I get a list of three people. I don't know who they are. I mean, the people who are supposed to have done the, uh, the selection exercise know better than me, but I'm not supposed to take any three. And then, you know, when it comes to appointment, all manner of pressures come into place and all manner of lobbying takes place, all manner of blackmail takes place. You know, you then select somebody. Since the law says you can take any one of the three, Maybe the guy who came highest is not taken, and the person who came second or third is taken, and then it triggers into crisis in the university system. And also said that wasn't healthy. So uh, it was a person who now amended the law that says the governing council of the university can now appoint the chief executive. You know, but the corollary to the appointment of principal officers was the funding. You know, and that is where the issue of autonomy that you mentioned now becomes very critical. Where do you get your Where do you get your funding from? Ninety percent subvention by government to pay your salaries, capital grants by government, um, user charges that the universities then um, then uh, ask the students to pay for electricity, for accommodation, for water, and things like that, um, and then um, donations and grants from local international bodies, as the case may be. Now, 
In addition to the subvention by federal government, federal government agencies like TED funds, like NCC, uh, like NITDA, <coughs> like um, Petroleum Development Fund, PTDF, also support the public universities. So when you aggregate all these together, you now see the bulk of where the monies come from. But the fundamental difference between the public universities and the private universities is that tuition fee that between federal government, there's a, there's a, there's a proviso that says you do not charge tuition. And so um, <clears throat> you, uh, you, you don't have that critical component being part of the fee structure of the public universities, whereas you have that in the private universities. So when we talk about autonomy and you say, for example, the governing council that represents the interest of the proprietor, in which case, in this case, the federal government is, uh, is free to appoint is a lead, the leadership of the university, um, is free to, um, to make laws for the university, and then at the same time, it is not free to generate funds for the university as it deems fit, then you have a problem with that, um, that level of autonomy. It's not free <clears throat> to appoint staff as it deems fit. As it is now, all federal universities cannot appoint any outer of staff without clearance from the Office of the Head of Service. You must get clearance from the Office of Head of Service before you appoint a driver in a federal university, as it is now. So where does that leave you, you know, for autonomy that says on the other, by the law, that you can hire and fire um, uh, your, staff. your staff, you know. So um, you, cannot, you cannot pay your staff the salaries that you deem fit. So we have a centralized spot, whether you are in Meduguri or you are in Lagos or you are in Makodi or whatever, the salary structure is uniform. So if you have staff that, are, um, that have done over and above the basic requirements, you cannot pay them any preferential salary because all that again is also determined by one central um, uh, body. So the, the salaries of vice chancellors, the salaries of principal officers, all of them is fixed by government because these are, you know, so you have on the one hand government saying you are autonomous, but on the other hand there are wider variables that limit that autonomy to just certain things. No, is it the government, I mean, Chima, no, I know no, you want to come no. in here, uh, is it government that says, the law says, the law says, uh, yeah, that the, the, the law government is the this, law. This is part of what, this was part of uh, the agitation mm. for many years, as Professor yes. Chifu has explained. I, I mean, they, they just yeah. uh, take it from there, Jumai. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. You know, I, I was just trying to have a comparison between yeah. how universities were run in the 70s, in the 60s, compared to how it's run now. Would you say, in your own opinion, that universities back then had more, had more autonomy? Of course they had more autonomy. They had more autonomy. I attended University of Calabar. Uh, Professor Yandeli was my vice chancellor, you know. Um, if, if he went to the United States for a conference and met an academic who he felt was a necessary, should be a necessary member of his faculty, he could give him a temporary appointment, you know. Once he looks at his uh, CV and he says, he could give him a temporary appointment, you know, and the person will resume. And then they will go through the procedure. And if the procedure, after three months, six months, they find that the man is competent, they regularize his appointment, you know. Because part of the job of the vice chancellor is to head on for the best faculty. The faculty is the rock of the university, you know. So if you, if you went somewhere and you met somebody who was um, competent and you feel that that type of person should be, you know, you give him a job. So they, they, were, they, 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 they had that autonomy. They could, they, could, they could decide a lot of things. It's true that they also function under the purview of the regulatory body, which is the National Universities Commission, uh, that says, for example, your, you, cannot, you cannot recruit more administrative staff than academic staff. You cannot recruit um, more professors than um, uh, graduate assistants. They, they, there was a staff-student ratio that was worked out based on the capacity of the university. So all those guidelines were there, and once you work within the framework of those guidelines, we're okay. But here we are, fast forward, government is saying all the salaries, of course, at that time, each university paid its own staff uh, salary. From the government gave you a subvention, you use that uh, subvention to determine your, your salaries and overheads, and your bursary department prepared the payrolls and paid. 
But now you have a situation by everybody, every staff of the Federal University is paid from um, the IPPIS uh, pot because government says it wants to know um, who are his staff uh, and how they get paid, you know. Okay, Professor Chifu, thank you very much. Let's bring in uh, Professor uh, Christian Anieke. Yeah, Professor Anieke is with us uh, via Zoom. Of course, Professor Anieke, we know that uh, there are differences in terms of the autonomy speak uh, between public and private universities. Uh, but, but, of course, you've been through the academia. So, what does university autonomy entail? Yeah, I, I think the the Autonomy Act of 2004 and amended besides that is about self governance, is about self reliance, is about self control, is about self determination of universities. And uh, as Professor Ochebu said, it's just part of part and parcel of university life. It is the essence of university. Without autonomy, without the power to, to govern itself, without the power to, to do its own business, it is no longer university. The university has three statutory functions. One is research, two is teaching, and three is community service. And if the university doesn't have the, the, the capacity to do this in its own way, you, it, it, with its own initiative, with its own innovativeness, then it is no longer a university. It's about our understanding of university. What baffles me is how we actually go against the law of a nation. There is an act. There's a, an act. There's a law on this. And uh, the, the, the law is set aside and the things will continue and, as if a law does not exist. Then you ask yourself, why the National Assembly? Why do we have, why do we pay people to make laws and why do we approve laws that we never respect and all that? In the private university, of course, it's a different ball game. You have uh, the proprietor of the private university, a board of, board, board of trustees, and they have a governing council. But you see, like in our own university, God forbid, university, you see that the university does its business without any form of interference. The university decides what it's going to charge the students. The university decides where it's going to be looking for money and all. And that's how it can actually guarantee autonomy independence of thinking, independence of research, independence of these activities in, uh, in terms of community service and all that. So uh, this is actually what it is. I, I do hope that we fight the evil from the root. The evil is that the university autonomy and federal institutions and state institutions, that this autonomy has been tampered with. Uh, the strike should target that. The fight should be taking government to court on this issue of interfering with the autonomy of universities. That's exactly where the, the thing is. That's the bedrock of all the evils bedeviling the federal institutions. See how much time has been wasted and all that. It's not about, uh, it's, it's simply not about the structure of the university or government not doing it. It's about the fundamental issue of autonomy. If this is not guaranteed, then, of course, nothing works. We're going to continue to have strikes in the university. The university, the university should, be, should, be, uh, should have the freedom with the approval of the governing council to charge fees, to look for funding, to recruit people, to know the number of professors it needs, to invest in research, to invest in community service and all that. It should not be interfered with by any force in society. If this issue of autonomy is not addressed here, our universities will be, will be just a radical of what a university should be. Okay, the experts say that autonomy sort of prevents, you know, forced loyalty to an, uh, the party in power or, you know, political consideration. Would you say, in your own opinion, that politics has sort of, you know, played a role in ensuring that the universities are not fully funded because of the appointments, you know, coming from, politicals, from the political sphere? Uh, can I get that question again? The network is not quite... What I'm trying to say is that, would you say that the polit politics has played a role in ensuring that the autonomy of the universities in Nigeria, federal universities, I mean government-owned, is not fully implemented? Yes, you know, of course, you know that everything in this country revolves around politics. We don't actually have a system that is a kind of superstructure over and above politics in a nation. It is about the, the political class in many civilized worlds. I mean, 
you, you, you don't have this kind of superstructure where politics determines everything. Politics are set aside the civil service, every other organ of society. It just, that is it. It's it, it just a reflection of what is happening in other sector, not just in the field of education. Where, where I don't know how we came to the point that everything revolves around politics and all. But I want to, uh, I, I want to believe that the university should have the capacity to bring down this kind of structure where politics actually decides what happens. Even goes against the laws of a nation and nothing happens. It's all about politics. And but you see it everywhere, whether it's religion or in anything, social structure and all that civil service, is everything revolves around. And that shouldn't be. There should be a system that the works, a system that is a kind of superstructure that politics bows down to. And not the po uh, politics, whether polit the political setup is intelligent or not, it decides whether society will continue, whether society will live. So to bring down this kind of structure of uh, politics, dominance, everything in society will be the task of the next generations of Nigeria. Professor Adeke, thanks. Uh, let's pause you and come back to uh, Professor Ochefu here in the studios. Uh, Professor Ochefu. Professor Anuke has raised uh, some issues, I, and I would like you to respond to those issues. Namely, there is the law that guarantees university autonomy. And the elements of the autonomy include self-reliance. But it, it, it appears, if not that it is actually the case, that that law is not being fully respected. What is not gelling well with regard to a full obedience to the uh, prescription of the law with regard to autonomy? Very, very, very cogent question that hits the nail at the head. Um, so you have the law. Like he has said, the 2004 as amended university miscellaneous <clears throat> law. And you have seculars that come from agents of government that are also acting on the law. You have interventions from third party actors that are also acting based on their law. For example, you have professional bodies. Who come and say to universities that the law requires that they should determine how students that are going to graduate into their own profession should be trained? You get the point I'm making. I, I understand I, 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 and, um, and we know that there yes. yes. the, the, the 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 are medical professions. Yes, the medical engineers and they come in there. Yes, and and the university say to them. Yes, the university say to them. Wait, when we graduate these students, subject them to your professional exams. If they pass, they become your members. But you cannot, we can work together and say, we can sit down together and agree on the type of things you want to see in the curriculum that will help them in the field when they come there. But we insist that we must do this, we must do this, or that members of your profession must be heads of department and things like that are all um, uh, not part of our purview. Then they flash the law approved by the National Assembly that they are acting on this law. Salaries and wages commission are backed by law to determine salaries of public servants. Uh, Federal Character Commission is backed by law to determine the composition of staff in the universities. You know, so everybody comes with his own version of the law and says, you university you are not operating within the ambience of the law. So we have conflicts you know, in the determination and interpretation of these laws that make it difficult for the universities to, uh, to function. As it is now, for you to employ staff in the federal university, you have to get permission from Office of the Head of Service. In some cases, they will say, you want to replace professors that are retiring. And they say, ah, the, prof the, the salaries of professors are too expensive. Go for lecturer too. And you try to explain to them that the lecturer too cannot do the job of a professor. Worst case scenario is senior lecturer, but not a lecturer too. You know, you have that argument. And then once they approve a list, 
the Federal Character Commission will now say there is not enough spread in your composition of staff. The staff is square towards this direction or towards that direction. So everybody is coming from the perspective of the law. So I think part of what Professor Nike said that um, it's also um, uh, interesting is that probably it is time for us to test these laws, you know, um, uh, and their interpretation uh, at the judicial level to say um, who is doing um, because the law establishing the university, for example, uh, vests the power of so many of these things in the Senate. No. But Senate is not able to function because there are other bodies that come and say um, they are the ones that are supposed to do this, help you do this for you. And it does not, it, it does not add up at all. So maybe time has come for us to go and test the thing in the, in the, in the law courts and see who is doing right and who is doing wrong. Well, uh, uh, Jumai, uh, uh, Professor, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Chefu and uh, Professor Aneke. Professor Aneke, I'm sure you heard what Professor Chefu said. Part of what we are dealing with, it appears, uh, is, uh, is constraining uh, full autonomy for public universities. Is one, if you may, the internal inconsistency. The internal inconsistency within the laws establishing the uh, universities themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say this, uh, for example, if the University of Lagos Act 1962, mm -hmm. Now, the uh, University Miscellaneous uh, Act of 2004, mm. uh, of course, uh, amends that law, mm. as with other federal public universities, and now grants autonomy to the University of Lagos Act of 1962. Uh, mm. But that grant says, on the one hand, look, you are free, self-reliance, X, Y, Z, and so on and so forth, to do whatever you wish to do. But at the same time, your freedom to do whatever you want to do is constrained by the lingering federal government disposition not to charge tuition fees in, 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 uh, in federal public investors. Is that correct, Prof? It is correct. Okay. Is correct. And, and then, that is on the one hand. On the one hand, yes. So, on the one hand, you have internal inconsistencies. Mm. That is to say, between the amending, amending legislation and what you refer to as the principal legislation. Yes. yes. Then, the, the bigger issue has to now do with, as, as we lawyers will say, subsidiary legislation, mm -hmm. which will come by way of all those circulars you are talking about, and so on and so forth. That's, that's another issue. Mm -hmm. The third one will now come also from the provisions mm -hmm. in several other uh, in, uh, 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 provisions of the laws establishing several other bodies. Mm -hmm. For instance, Federal Character Commission. Yeah. That NUC, actually, uh, NUC uh, well, whatever you know, the professional bodies that have the equivalent of being chartered, for mm -hmm. instance, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. the equivalent, the Council of Legal Education, uh, Korean, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. uh, Nigerian Medical and Data Council will say, no, this is what you must do. Mm -hmm. So they are constrained. So you have three levels mm -hmm. of of challenges, if you may. Yeah. Of, am I correct? You're correct. Very uh, correct. Uh, all right. Very so correct. thanks. So we will begin to unpack each of these things and then see how uh, they square. We have another guest who is uh, going to join us for this conversation. We earlier indicated that he will be with us. Professor Ibrahim Garba is joining us uh, from our, our Benin uh, Network uh, Center. He's a former Vice Chancellor at Madubelo University in Zaria. Professor Garba, I don't know what you are doing in Benin, but uh, let, me, let me tell our viewers that anyone who needs expertise in, uh, in mining and solid mineral uh, issues, of course, will tap into uh, your base of knowledge. We don't have uh, solid minerals in Benin City per se. Uh, we have oil and gas, but in a do not, yes, you do have solid minerals there. Professor Garba, we're not discussing mining this morning. We're discussing university governance. A pleasure to have you with us on the program this morning. Looks like uh, there's an audio challenge. We could see Professor uh, Garba smiling, which means he could hear us. Mm. Uh, are the engineers sorting that out? Do we give them some time? If I uh, get that information from our director, we we'll go over to uh, Professor uh, Anieke, mm -hmm. who is still with us via Zoom. Is uh, Professor Garba all right now with his audio? All right, uh, Professor Anieke, uh, again, let's return to you uh, with regard to the, the three issues that are hobbling mm. uh, autonomy in public universities, internal inconsistencies in the legislation, 
uh, establishing those universities, uh, the impact of subsidiary legislation, circulars, and so on and so forth, and provisions in the laws establishing a number of agencies uh, and bodies that now seek to also interfere mm. with the operations and activities of universities, thereby constraining their autonomy. What is your take on this? Uh, it is very important uh, also uh, uh, to address uh, these inconsistencies, as uh, probably careful pointed out, and uh, so sorry, I directed. Uh, we have uh, the bodies that can actually address this. Uh, we have the Senate, of course, and we have the courts at uh, different levels. Of course, the Supreme Court will have the last uh, word on the interpretation of the, of the laws of the nation. Uh, because uh, when we you fight, and then you realize that uh, you are fighting on something that actually is very inconsistent, uh, because the fight becomes a little challenging. So I think uh, effort should be directed to uh, resolve these inconsistencies, the different laws, uh, your laws established in university, laws of different uh, organs, and all that. And, uh, trying to because that will be the, the I, I said it before that is going to be the direction and uh, I, I don't know whether the universities will have the courage to do this they have that courage to take the all the, the issues uh, to the national assembly be selected precisely or to court if there's need to do so because that's actually where the problem is that we have all these inconsistencies and these organs will normally put their own law and say well this is the law, your autonomy, and then this is our own law also. And then you have difficulty in trying to know which one is actually the right thing to do. So the, the Senate, the, the, the courts, should be able to help us to know where the university actually stands. But I want to believe, as it is in many nations, that the autonomy of universities supersedes every other thing. I won't believe that. As it, the university is the highest institution of learning in any nation. And when you interfere with this, then you interfere with the whole nation. Tell me the quality of your university, and I will tell you the quality of your nation. So, in the presence of this plethora of laws, we should be able to give the university its promise in determining content of knowledge, research, and the quality of community service in a nation. Oh, uh, Christian, we'll get back to you. Let me come back here to the studio. Uh, a prof. We've talked about factors militating against autonomy of universities in Nigeria and um, students not paying tuition fee in the federal universities. Can you break it down for us, the actual cost of university education? And is this sustainable without funding from the government itself? Will it be sustainable? How can this university generate their funding? Yeah, in, 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 in global climes, Public universities are funded with direct subventions from governments or tuition fees that are charged by students but are, are predicated on support for indigent students who are not able to pay the fees. The first question he asked, how much does it actually cost? Yeah, yeah NUC has worked out those costs. Other agencies have worked at the cost. Committee of Vice Chancellors have worked at the cost. You know, all we, all we need to do now is to update it to take care of current inflationary measures. The first major person who worked at that cost was Professor Peter Okebukala when he was a um, uh, NUC uh, Executive Secretary. And he says, we need to know a student studying medicine in a, in a university at the 100 level, what is the cost? The cost for 100 level is not the same with 200 level and as you make progress because you transit into um, several um, areas. Mm. So that cost is there. We know it. It's established. It's expensive. Um, as at the last time we checked, it was like about 2.2 million for medicine at the 100 level. Per session. Per session. Yes. And that is just the tuition for uh, a loan. Then you have other levels of costing. Um, which has to do with the user charges, accommodation, feeding, um, uh, internet um, access, security, and all those things. You aggregate those costs. Then you now come to living costs for the students because the student, again, also has to um, survive, like I said last time I was here, 210 days in a year on campus. You know, he has to feed, you know. So you have indigent students, you have regular students, and you have well-to-do students. 
So the well-to-do students is a student who has a smartphone, a high-end smartphone. An indigenous student will be one who does not have a phone at all or has a touchlight phone. You know, and they are all in the same environment. An indigenous student will probably eat one meal a day, and an uh, affluent student will eat three meals um, uh, in a day. This type of distinction is global. It's part of the history of the university tradition. You know, so you have students who come from well-to-do families that are sent to the universities. They live big. You went to the university, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you have students who pay their way through school. You know, who work, who work their way through, yes, they work their way through school. You know, so it's something that we do. So what government then does is to say, okay, uh, we're able to support these students who are indigent. We're able to say, okay, we'll give you a bursary, we'll give you a scholarship, full scholarship or part scholarship. You know, but if you are intelligent and you are indigent, you will not be denied um, accommodation. The big universities in the world, the Harvards, the Yale, the MITs, have that structure. If you get admission and you are not able to pay their fees, they will look for support from one place or the other for you. you know. So, But here we have a situation where there is an ideological thinking that, especially from the academic staff union, that if you charge fees, they are going to deny a lot of Nigerians the opportunity to go to school. Uh, so federal government should look for alternative ways of funding education to say do not charge tuition other user charges are available but tuition don't charge you can support this 2.2 million we're talking about you can get it so what we're now saying to government said no problem if you don't want to charge tuition fees pay us pay the universities the exact cost of providing university education for the number of students that you can afford so if by your manpower planning process, you need 5,000 engineers and it costs 10 billion to train 5,000 engineers, you write a check for 10 billion to the universities that you have nominated to train 5,000 engineers for you. But to come and say, okay, all lots of apparel for like example, at the 2022 budget, I think it was 322 billion that federal government allocated for overheads for um, for all the um, 45 plus federal universities, 200 and, um, 322 billion or something like that, 6.1 billion for capital uh, grants, and then 25 billion for overheads. You know, you know, overheads includes power. University of Lagos alone spends 1.6 billion naira on power. Paranum. Paranum. Dito Ahmed Bello University. You know, Diesel costs to run generators in Bayer University. Can you can call Professor Sagi and ask him? It's about fifty million a month. So, what is being given to the universities by government via their subvention is is like less than twenty percent of what they require. You know, you know. So, universities are supposed to do research. They are supposed to do uh, look for monies from other sources. You know. But what, we're, what we're, the argument that is being made is that in this cost-sharing situation between government and parents and their and and their students, um, that percentage should move up from like about three percent that is actual that is currently to, be, to even ten percent to help improve the facilities that the universities have to be able to deliver on their mandate of quality education for their um, for, for for their students. Okay, uh, Professor Chefu, thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to return to the issue of autonomy mm. and how that can then impact uh, the uh, funding structure and funding issues that you've also talked about. You know, we touched on them mm. uh, last Friday on this conversation. We understand now that the audio uh, connection from Benin has been cleared up by uh, our engineers. Uh, uh, Professor Garba, if you can... Uh, if you can hear me, and of course, uh, we can also hear you, then uh, you take this question. And by the way, let me make a correction. I was saying earlier that uh, I didn't know what we were doing in Benin because there are no solid minerals in Benin. I'm sure uh, some persons are going to argue that we have a lot of clay uh, in Benin, and uh, you need clay for the production of tires, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and I remember one point you made at uh, uh, a meeting uh, some uh, about a year or so ago now, when you defined the real meaning 
of mining that what is mining is what you mine is not used by you by yourself but it is used by others i believe that is still correct if i remember that probably it's me a c for that uh, recollection <laughs> but prof Garba, we're dealing with uh, how to rethink uh, 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 the autonomy of uh, public investors in nigeria against the backdrop of uh, a persistent asso strike and some of the core issues that often don't get to be addressed is the current autonomy structure working for our public universities and if so what is wrong with it thank you very much um i think for me we need to clear our minds and have very proper understanding of the fact that uh, when you talk about autonomy of a university it's not an absolute thing, to be honest with you. It has to be uh, specific. Uh, it has to be put in context. And uh, we should know limitations. Why? Because, uh, you know, for any sector that operates in any country and within any human endeavor, it has to be regulated. So to what extent you get your autonomy is to the extent that you respect the framework of the regulations that determines the sustainability of that sector. So what I mean by that is that uh, if we were in education business, first of all, there must be a national education agenda, philosophy, you know, and aspirations in which anybody that operates within that uh, framework, or within that sector, should aspire to, should conform to. So what I mean is that if you now aspire to have an autonomy, now what autonomy for what? You, nobody will give you autonomy to do whatever you want. No university on earth has total autonomy. We can go to all other climbs and discover that whoever owns the university, government, private, would have reasons for putting that university and would have some sense or some means through which their, their, their goal or aspirations are met by that university. So, in our own case, for example, when we say we want autonomy, we, of course we have autonomy. For example, now the government has given us some level of autonomy uh, to our governing councils to be in charge of our first university in terms of taking, uh, taking care of our finances uh, to the extent that the finances are also uh, given by government uh, significantly. Uh, and then our, our, our freedom also, for example, by the council of the council to appoint vice chancellors and other principal officers. So this, this autonomy, this freedom that we're talking about, uh, always have to be put in context. So we have to, and it's going to be an evolving issue. For example, now, how much autonomy do we have? How much more do we want to get? And for what purpose and for what reason? You know, even private universities don't have the autonomy that we think they should. I compare this autonomy matter to the, the, our political confusion in Nigeria when you now uh, have a federal republic and then we run a unitary system of government. And then people now begin to begin to agitate all the time and uh, that we want that semblance of autonomy to the constituent uh, regions that that make up the federation, so 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 this autonomy in Nigeria is still is still being evolved, is still being understood, and uh, so we need to really continue to take it one at a time, uh, gain one, uh, consolidate it, use it well, and then uh, uh, go for more. Really, so for example, I had your discussion about the concept of financial autonomy. If you give the universities autonomy now, financially, first of all, I tell you, <laughs> practically all cannot survive. Uh, you know, even the government grants that are given, like I, my colleagues are saying, are, are not enough in any way. Uh, the parents are either the unwilling or they are unable to, 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 to also bear significantly the cost of the education. But above all, I think we need to also begin to see the purpose of universities more towards getting who are our most important stakeholders, which are the students. In many parts of the world today, everything is centered around students first, before anything else. 
So we must begin to engage our students. Let our students understand that they are building a future within a framework that they also must invest. And the more they invest, the better for the system. And of course, while we also continue to now begin to, 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 to point out and even agitate for, for, for the owners of the university, whether they are government or private, to provide the needed uh, materials uh, that, of course, they put in the university, uh, knowing that such are really necessary if you want really quality education. So quality education for me and uh, student-centered learning in all this it should be around which issues we begin to agitate and, 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 and get more and more autonomy uh, and more and more responsibility for, from our stakeholders in order to make best use of our so-called autonomy. Thank you. Okay, Professor, uh, Professor Ivan Galba, you said um, uh, the autonomy should be specific and put in context. In relation to what are we talking about here now? Well, for example, now universities are, have been given through the, 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 the current legal framework autonomy, for example, by, to the councils to appoint the vice chancellors and the principal officers of the university and also control the finances of the university. So how has, has anybody analyzed and uh, to what extent has this helped the universities themselves? Because if the councils of the universities, for example, are appointed by the government who pays for everything practically, then of course you, 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 you probably will mislead yourself by thinking that you are really autonomous. Because one way or another, who pays the piper will dictate the tunes. And or, if it is a council of a private university owned by a certain individual or groups or corporate bodies that takes care of much of what is there, of course they will do. We know even in, a, in, the, in the United States, in Britain and so on, uh, yes, there is remarkable freedom of intellectual thoughts, uh, but still the country regulates certain aspects that the universities must also conform, especially when you want to draw grants and subventions from the government itself. So that, that mean, what, I'm, what I'm saying is now is, for example, one, one, of, what, one of the things that we, we want to see in full autonomy is the ability of universities to determine the criteria for admitting their students, to determine which courses they want to run and how. But you know, in today's, in today's Nigeria and in many countries, there are also an umbrella regulatory body, for example, that controls the national aspiration in terms of, uh, of access to the education from the diversity of, uh, of our country. And of course, also the National Diversity Commission that knows the philosophy of the education Nigeria wants to give and, and control the standards of the education. So if you leave each university, for example, to determine its own standards, to determine the kind of students they will admit, I mean, you will have many countries in one country, I believe. So, 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 so that's what I'm saying. It has to be specific, and it has to be one at a time as we, as we develop and grow. The concept of university education in our developing countries cannot be certainly at a par with the concept and the stage of the higher education, for example, in the developed world. Even then, we know that what I'm saying is that even then, they don't have this total or full autonomy. We have had information or news whereby in best universities like Harvard and MIT in the United States, where the government also monitors scientists that are doing some particular research. And this is even intellectual, intellectual engagement. People are doing research to promote knowledge, but the government is very wary and is following to see to what extent is that research affecting the national security or national question or whatever it is or the global uh, politics uh, and what, what, what have you of that country. So that's why I'm saying that it has to be specific and then evolve gradually one at a time. Professor Ibrahim Garbat, thank you very much uh, for your explanation. As, as uh, you have indicated, uh, and then your other brother professors have also said, the uh, aspects relating to university autonomy are variegated. There are many. Uh, one of the latest examples you, you cited now 
of course, uh, has to do with uh, academic freedom. Uh, uh, and then of, there are boundaries, usually, uh, beyond which you cannot go. If, you, for instance, you're talking about national security, uh, there are also ethical issues uh, that, that govern that. But our, our principal focus to narrow it down relates more to how to ensure uh, better governance of our public university system. Better governance. We, as you said, with re respect to when we say that oh, we are a federal we are a republic, let's say a federation, and in the meantime, you are having uh, many instances of unitary practices and so on and so forth. That tension that arises, how do we resolve those tensions? Now, let me ask the question specifically. What is the role of governing councils today? How can that role be enhanced such that universities or public universities to be more specific are not just another set of parastatals? How can they generate more revenue so that some of these uh, issues that Asudomali will go on strike over and about can be taken care of within university system themselves, always uh, rather than boiling over and then getting uh, to the uh, 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 national uh, uh, table. And if we say that uh, governing councils are in charge, governing councils are, your, are the employers of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, university staff, why don't you pick quarrels every now and then with the federal government? Yeah, I, I, think, I think you are very right. Um, I think uh, for me, you know we need to look inwards. The universities have to live up to what they are supposed to be. Think, think and think. And strategize and see how they navigate through difficult situations of any kind. You know, if you look at the governing councils themselves, they are populated by people that are appointed by government. Of course, government will put people that they want or they are interested in or that are, uh, that are patrons to that government. So in any case, whoever comes to present government, that governing council will certainly come with the, with the mindset that, yes, they will protect government interests and ensure good value for the government that is funding these universities. Now, internally, the people that populate the council, because there are more internal members of a university, in, a, in any particular university government council, than the external members. But then, even the internal dynamics, the internal members, are always dictated by the dynamics of the internal mechanisms of that system. Politics of the, loca of the local university is also too important, or very important, whereby you may probably find universities that have certain so-called uh, kingmakers or godfathers that still determine who gets into the university governing council from the, from the vast population of the academic staff. It's not the most, the most intelligent people that gets into the governing council. It's not the most politically minded people, most experienced. So you find sometimes the internal representation is also weak or is there but de devoid of any idea as to move that university forward beyond certain beliefs or dogmas or, 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 or self-interest of some parts of the university community. So even the recruitment mechanism of the internal representation is also as bad as the, as the recruitment from the gov government side. So that's why maybe sometimes, and when you put two people, two minds together like that, and maybe some of the people coming from government have no appreciation or no experience of the university system, even though the law says there should be people that are, that are, that are familiar with the university system. And then you have people from the internal uh, sources that have little or no idea about how government external or external system operate. So you have, what you get is a long time spent on trying to reconcile, trying to even have a common front on any issue. You find that an issue tabled in any governing council will first have been determined by a group, whether it's external or internal, and then come and contest for those arguments, sometimes for the good of the system, but other times are just for, for selfish ends. So even the universities themselves, 
they must be seen to be reservoirs of wisdom and knowledge. So that when arguments and, and uh, come out of the university, it should be, it should be seen to be really uh, thought out and a, a logically sound uh, position that even the people in government will have no reason not to, not to accept. But once we make weak arguments from the system, or we, we, we find ways through which we are also behaving as bad or even worse than the people that we are fighting for, then sometimes it puts us in a very, very weak position to continue to agitate and, uh, and convince the, 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 the public that we serve to understand where we are and, uh, and help us in, 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 in the agitation to make the system even better for everybody. So the point I'm making here is that we need a lot of internal um, reformations uh, to, to, to really begin to see our universities are contributors to development. We hear people now telling us that if, as more, as, as the more we agitate the government to give us more funding, what are we giving in return? The students who produce, we know what they are. What, again, what research are we making that is impacting society? And so on and so forth. So the moment we are not meeting these other obligations from our own end, it will put us in a very weak position to begin to now look at the, at the other parties, other stakeholders, to say that they are not also fulfilling their own responsibility to the system. So it takes both sides, to be, in my opinion, to, to really begin to reform the system for, for, for better uh, services, service delivery. Thank you. All right, you are watching Good Morning Nigeria on the Network Service of the Nigerian Television Authority. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll continue with the conversation. Yeah, welcome back, and you're watching Good Morning Nigeria. We've been talking about the autonomy of Nigerian like, universities, and um, we have our guest here in the studio, and um, as the program begins to wind down, we will be asking them some fundamental questions that they will be giving answers to. Um, Prof, if the universities get full autonomy, what guarantees that the powers given to it will not be abused? Uh, like Professor Garba mentioned, uh, within the context of your know, regulatory authority, autonomy is guided. It's never full. You know, I've always said we need to rethink the philosophy of university education in this country. We have not done so in a very long time. Um, the fundamental dynamics of our development, you know, has put into place some questions that we need to answer as far as the role of our university education is concerned. You know, full autonomy, the way it is understood in certain climes, will always be contextualized. You, 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 you never allow anybody to run riot as it were. You know, so the, the regulatory body will define the parameters on which that authority should work. Where we have now is between the regulatory body, NUC, you know, and all the plethora of bodies that are available, the parameters that enable the university to do their, to play their role in society, to function in, within the governance environment that they should function, and in consonance with global best practice, does not exist. That is the point we are trying to make. Yeah. The universities themselves will be self-regulatory because they have their own level of structures from the faculty uh, from the department to the faculty faculty to senate senate to management management to council these are all self-regulatory mechanisms to ensure that one person does not do a different thing you know and then of course um, you have like prof said which is very very important which is something that we don't do very well student-centered university development to what extent are students in the fore of all our operations because it is the learning outcomes of these students that determine what transits into the rest of society. So um, all those will form part of the regulatory framework that will help insulate this autonomy that we are talking about from abuse. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I, I'm just wondering, uh, Professor uh, Anike, if you're still there with us uh, via Zoom, uh, Professor. Uh, 
uh, Anike, if we can see you, all right. So that's evidence that uh, the Zoom connection is, uh, is is superb still. What do we make of the existing autonomy, and how can we improve on it? Earlier, we had identified at least three major impediments, internal inconsistencies in the principal legislation and uh, amending legislation establishing the public investors. We also talked about uh, the impact of subsidiary legislation, circulars, and so on and so forth. And more importantly, the role of third-party agencies, uh, such as Federal Character Commission, for instance, and the regulatory bodies for vulnerable professions that will seek to also detect uh, to, uh, the, uh, to the universities on how they are run. And in the meantime, you have the uh, superstructure of the NUC, which superintends public and private universities uh, around the country do you, uh, are they having uh, are they having too many masters to report to uh, thank you i don't think they're having too many masters to report to uh one philosopher says it's where man is free but everywhere in chains and the, the chains are the, the structures of control that you have i do not also think that uh, uh, autonomy means lack of control or absence of control. Uh, as long as we're in society, we, we experience all sorts of controls because, yeah, uh, freedom ends where my own freedom begins, as we know. So it's, 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 it's not a matter of uh, these structures of being too many, it's a matter, matter of clarification of the boundaries. The boundaries have to be properly defined. That's exactly the, the, the point. The challenge before us now is the ASO strike. And uh, it's about financial autonomy. And of course, the governing council raised that. Uh, the two professors, my colleagues, have raised that issue of governing council and self determination. But we must actually be uh, more focused on this because that, I think that's actually why we are brainstorming on, uh, on, this, on this topic, on this uh, theme. Uh, financial autonomy of universities. Uh, it is very important to me. And we must also, as Professor Chair said, determine uh, who, who actually, what, what Nigeria actually needs, what's the manpower, what's the cost of the manpower, and how the university can generate the cost and all that. It's very, very important that the universities get financial autonomy. How this autonomy is guaranteed within the university, as Professor Chair said, has already been, I mean, there, is, there is a structure in place to actually ensure that uh, uh, once the financial autonomy is guaranteed, this uh, is not abused. You have internal uh, capacity, internal mechanism in a, each university to control this. So how does this happen? I think that should be a major concern, not whether we have too many controls, because I believe that these controls can be clarified, so that the boundaries are properly defined. But the issue now is how universities, especially federal universities, can achieve a modicum of financial autonomy. Determine how many students they can have, what the cost is, and who pays the cost. If government is not prepared to pay the cost of the students, then parents have to pay. Someone has to pay. There's nowhere in the world where education is free because somebody is paying. The question now is who pays? Well, federal government cannot be a dog in the manger in this matter. You don't want to pay, and they don't want the university to look for the money and all that. This is very important to me because. When you look at what is happening, we don't even calculate the psychological cost of the state at home. We're just concerned at our home. To so bring these young people back to campus again, back in the real sense of readiness to study again with... I was seem to have lost, you know, the Zoom network there. And Kisi, you're just saying that the Zoom is superb. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. it's it, okay. it been uh, superb uh, throughout most of the conversation. I think is uh, the director is indicating that uh, he's back. But it, 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 it's a critical question yeah. relating to... Because all of these matters we're talking about now revolve around university governance. Uh, governance will be what is the basis of the governors. Is it autonomy or is it uh, independence? I, I mean, I've used, the, I've used the phrase advisedly to say that, look, federal universities, for instance, even state universities, appear to just be like another federal government parastata or a state government parastata. 
So where is the autonomy? That is, in other words, what is the relative independence of action for you to be able to carry on your activities that universities are known all over the world to carry out? It doesn't appear to me to be the case, uh, Professor Brian Garba, that universities in Nigeria will have a specific uh, function, different and distinct from the role of universities worldwide. I mean, that's why I'm sure that university lecturers uh, professors often make the argument that it is the universality of of uh, of the system that makes uh, a university system, a university unique that you cannot be an island on, on, yeah. unto yourself. So, uh, Professor Ibrahim uh, Gaba, I'd like to also ask you this question: What can we do uh, to gradually get away? If I say, what can we do now? More particularly, the governing councils and the proprietor of uh, federal public investors, in this case, the federal government, to see that since funding, at least to a considerable extent, is a challenge now, what can be done to ramp up uh, funding? Uh, and then, well, of course, once you wrap up funding, we are also talking about internal controls because we hear that there is uh, some level of indiscipline and unaccountability uh, for funds, even in the university system. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, um, what we first need is planning. Planning from top to bottom. i give you an example. You see, this is a country where you wake up today, somebody will stand up in the National Assembly and proclaim that he wants a university in his local government. And so be it. Or the government itself will just wake up one day and say they want three more, six more universities of such and such distributed in such and such places. I mean, who's, who, who sat down to plan what these universities will be, how they'll be funded, how, how do you, 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 you get the manpower, the facilities for them to function? So it's like we, we, we don't understand or we don't take this higher education Thing to be something that will need a lot of thinking and planning and strategy to put in place. This idea of uh, national distribution of things in this country that uh, you bring universities, distribute them, geopolitical laws, you bring universities to states, you bring, you know, and no, no planning on ground, for goodness sake. So you now send people to go and manage these universities and then have no clue of how, how to really go about it. So, even within the university system itself, i give an example now. If in a university like Amadibele University, when I was in office, the government will appropriate about 150 million naira overhead for the, for the year. Rarely do we get 80 to 90 million release over the year. And they come not regularly, they come maybe two months no release, another month 20 million, another month 10 million, 30, 15, like that. So this does not allow you to plan because that is the main source. The students pay substantially. If, for example, I give you an example in Amadebele University that in any one year, our students' fee collection will amount to about 2 billion naira, given the current rates. Now, the government, on the other hand, is putting about 11 billion to pay our salaries for the year. Because ABU, at least when I was in office, was taking about 1.2 billion naira for salary every month. So, you can imagine how much more will you ask the students to pay that will in any way begin to even cut up for, if you give autonomy, for example, the salaries of staff. That is one thing. But the government comes along with, a, in my opinion, with a lot of intervention. You see, we, de we, don't, we don't seem to, to take like third point intervention as funding. We don't t take central bank intervention as funding. We don't take NNPC intervention as funding. No, they are funding because they provide things that you use money to buy. But the lack of planning is such that when those inter interventions come that probably were never thought of, then we cannot manage it. Let me give an example. Tech fund interventions. Tech fund intervention comes every year to universities. 
what do we use them for? Building, building, building. Yet, there is no money to maintain the buildings, no money to supply power, no money to supply water. So, can't we plan that we have had enough of buildings? For how long can we continue to build, you know, to build structures? At the same time, the government also does not have control much about the intake of students. Every year, 1.2 million, 1.7 million as prior to going to universities, and we have to cater for them within the spaces available. Of course, we end up taking only one-third of those students. Even those one-third that are taken, believe me, if you go nitty-gritty, you will find it's probably one-third of them that, believe me, essentially ought to be in the university. Or being in the university will actually be helpful to their aspiration in life. So the, the, because of this lack of planning, of the strategy of edu higher education in Nigeria, that everybody wants to go into the university and get that degree certificate, no matter the value of that certificate. So, fundamentally, if, we, if the education uh, philosophy, the, the policy, al allows this hair thing, I may say, that there is no real control about, like my colleague was saying, how many doctors do you produce and from where in every given year? How many engineers? How many this? How many that? I was once opportune to, to, to go to university to accredit my own professional course, geology. And I found 300 students in a class. So I asked the vice chancellor, why do you take 300 students in a class of geology? How will you teach them in the field? He said, no, we have to understand that the people from this area, or every person wants to read geology because of oil industry. I said, do you know how many people the oil industry takes in a year? I said, not more than 10 in the whole country. So, how do you now subject 300 students from only your university with others to go and compete for little position? And by doing so, if you don't work in the oil industry, you are useless. Or if you don't work in the extractive sector industry, you are useless. It's better you will train you as a biology, physics, chemistry teacher where there are great demands in our secondary school to teach. But this lack of planning has left everybody to do what he wants in the country and by so doing, whatever you bring is as good as the paper you put on it, as long as there is no planning that is, that is, uh, that is acceptable from top to bottom. Government, executive, National Assembly, people don't work in parallel, to be honest, in this country. So uh, we should expect that when they work in harmony and we have a national agenda or philosophy to pursue, then trickle it down to the universities. And even the universities now will have to imbibe that kind of uh, approach and planning. Because, to be honest with you, all universities in the world reflect the character of the society within which they are built. The universities will attempt to change the character of that society probably, but in, in, most, in more chances, in more times than the, is the, is the external forces that change the universities so that the universities will begin to behave like the external, uh, the, the, the outside society, and if it is sometimes even worse, probably, because uh, of, 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 of probably this idea of universities that are being, that have a lot of freedom to do. And I'm, I'm here thinking that, look, have we agitated? Do we have problem with actually limitation of freedom of thought? We don't. We look, has any lecturer in Nigeria University been arrested by government by saying what he said from his research or from his thinking. No, and I think that's the number one freedom, uh, autonomy in, 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 in the concept in universities. Freedom of the intellectual discourse in research and so on. And I don't think we have, what we do have more is the lack of the capacity to actually even do that, that, we should, that should be our obligation to society. Professor Garba, thanks a lot. We are pressed for time, and we're going to have to sign everybody up. But I, I, I just would like, because of the interest, if you can proceed, Professor Uchefu, and this relates to the reporting lines that I talked about. I asked uh, Professor Anieke, and he said, look, there aren't too many reporting lines, but you seem to have a contrary view. Mm -hmm. For instance, the Vice Chancellor, uh, or uh, who's a member of the Governing Council, are there too many reporting lines that are destructive to efficient management of the investors? Very briefly. There are too many reporting lines. The average Vice Chancellor of a federal university will need to report to at least 12 federal institutions while in office. 
from the regulatory bodies to the National Assembly committees, at least four major committees in the National Assembly at the level of the Senate and the government, to Office of the Accountant General, to Office of the Auditor General, to, um, to Office of the Head of Service, uh, to Federal Character Commission. All these bodies write letters on a daily basis to Federal Vice Chancellors to do this, to do that. So there are too many reporting lines that are distractive to the federal university the vice chancellor of the federal university um, is always on the road rather than focusing on looking for money for his university is on the road reporting to all these agencies that i've listed here which is not healthy at all okay professor akubu abokio chair for secretary general committee of vice chancellors of nigerian universities and also secretary general committee of pro chancellors of nigerian federal universities Thank you so much for your insight into the topic. It Thank you very a much. Continuous conversation. It is a continuous conversation. And from our Benin studio, we are joined by Professor Ibrahim Garba, former Vice Chancellor Ahmad Ubalo University area. Thank you so much for coming and good morning, Nigeria. And we are soon we are joined from Enugu by Professor Christian Aneke. He is the Vice Chancellor of jo Godfrey Okoye University in Enugu. Thank you so much for coming on Good Morning Nigeria. Okay, that's it for us on Good Morning Nigeria today. We appreciate your being with us. Uh, join us again tomorrow for a fresh package of the program, same time, 7 in the morning. I'm Kingsley Osadolo. And I'm Jumo Yusuf. Do have a wonderful day.